In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, you think you know somebody, and then they do something, and it makes you wonder, do I really know them? Maybe you've got a friend, and you've known this person a long time, and he's faithful, he's loyal, he's kind, he's trustworthy, but then you find out he's been telling lies about you behind your back. Come on, man, what gives? This happens in another way, too, sometimes. You think you know somebody, but you're not really willing to trust them all the way. I, this typically happens, right, when there's a couple and they're just starting to date, and will he, will he stay faithful to me, and will she go back out with me, and they just don't know, and they're unsure of each other, and so they don't quite trust each other. But imagine, you know, if you were in that situation, and, and, and you had known that person, and you had proven to that person that you're faithful, that you had proven you're trustworthy, and, and, and loving, and kind, and honest, and after all this time, they still wouldn't give you their trust. You might wonder, after all we've been through, after all we've done, and you still don't trust me? Don't you know me yet? You think Jesus could ever say that to you and me? Don't you know me? Well, I'd raise my hand and I'd say, well, yes, Lord, I know you very well. I mean, after all, I'm a pastor. I have to know you especially well, right? I mean, I preach your word, I hear your word, I ponder your word, I study your word, I pray all this. I know you, of course I do. But let me let you in on a little bit of a secret. I can grumble and complain with the best of them. Things aren't going my way. Ministry isn't happening the way I want it to, and I can get out my violin and play a pretty sad song. And that's terrible. I should know better. Right? I know Jesus. I know. I hear his word. And here I am grumbling and complaining. You follow me, right? I mean, here you are in church. You're hearing God's word. You're living your life. You're studying. You're reading your Bibles. You're praying. And then the grumbling comes. Well, I suppose I'm going to have to do that at home now, too. Or, when are the kids ever going to figure this out and learn? Or, when's work going to actually start feeling enjoyable? Or, right, another, another health problem, right? Just throw it on the heap with the other ones. Right? Grumble, 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 complain, complain, complain. And yet we know better, don't we? Well, today we meet some professional grumblers, you could say. The, the children of Israel, as they are leaving captivity, their, their slavery in Egypt. And that's where we pick it up today in Exodus chapter 16. You can follow along in your worship folder if you'd like to. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, you, know that it was the, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came 
and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Each one is to gather as much as he needs. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered as much as he needed. Then Moses said to them, No one is to keep any of it till morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. The Israelites were fresh out of their slavery in Egypt. Maybe it's been about six months since then. And they had a front row seat to the power and glory of the Lord. They had seen the Lord perform all of these plagues on the, the nation of Egypt, bringing it to its knees. They had seen the Lord bring them up out of slavery and, and walking through that, that Red Sea on dry ground. They had seen all of this. And now here they were, grumbling, grumbling in a big way. Oh, if only we had died in Egypt. You know, we had it so much better, so much better in Egypt. I mean, time out here. Let's think about how much this makes sense. The Lord has, has brought us out into this wilderness to kill us. So does this make sense? The Lord goes through all this trouble to, to bring Egypt, the world power of its day, down to its knees so that they'll let Israel leave, only to just execute the Israelites in the wilderness. That makes a lot of sense. And then they romanticize their time in Egypt as if things were going so well there. Oh yeah, so my slave driver broke my arm today and beat me up, but at least I had a pot of meat waiting for me at home. As if they had it that good. No, they were just, they were just thinking with their bellies, weren't they? They really didn't know the Lord in spite of what he had done. They really didn't know him yet. And so the Lord wanted to make himself known. So what's he do? Provides them with food, the meat, the, the bread, the special bread from heaven that they called manna. Takes care of them physically. Takes care of them spiritually. He provides leaders, Moses and Aaron, to take care of their spiritual needs. He provides them with a special day in the week where they can sit and worship and not have to worry about work and, and they can ponder their relationship with God. He, he brings them into his presence and, and reveals his glory to them. Because he loves them, because he cares about them, because he wants them to have a relationship with him. And when they would know him, not just know him as the God who, who takes care of them, but the God who loves them, who, who wants them to know him, who wants to know them, then they would know the Lord. In fact, three times in this section, we have this phrase, and then they will know the Lord, or you will know the Lord. That word know in the Old Testament can be used in a couple of different ways. The first way is the one that we always think of, like I know my name, I know what day of the week it is, I know my ABCs, that kind of knowing, right? Head knowledge. But those of you especially who are familiar with the King James Version of the Bible know that there is a second, more intimate use with that word know. It speaks of the intimacy between a husband and wife in marriage. You have passages in the Bible that, uh, in the King James would say, and Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. This idea of knowing somebody in that marital union is all about giving yourself to that other person and knowing them intimately. And this idea of intimate knowing in a husband and wife relationship is reflective of the kind of relationship that God wants to have with us that we would share all of us with him and he would share all of himself with us, especially his love. To know him, that's how God wanted to relate to these grumbling, complaining Israelites. He wanted them to know him, not so much as the God who took care of their physical needs, but as the God who cared about them and loved them intimately. 
then, when they knew God that way, then they could follow his commands, right? And, and we see those commands here as, as God gives the directions for the manna. You know, it could have been just as easy for God to just, you know, say, okay, it's going to be in the morning, go out and get it and enjoy it. Yeah? Done. Over, right? But the Lord wanted to test them. Not, not because he needed to know anything, because God obviously knows everything, but he wanted to test them with these directions to see if they would trust in him. Would they trust? that he would provide this for them? Would they trust that it was gonna come the next day like, like he said they would? Would they trust that an omer would be enough for each of them? An omer was about two liters. So if you think of like a two liter bottle of soda and you fill it up with bread, that's an omer. Would that be enough? So those directions were given very specifically. And then on Friday, right, gather two omers per person because there's not gonna be any on Saturday. That's the Sabbath day. You rest on that day. Would they trust? Some did. But we see some didn't either, right? They, they tried to keep it, right? Oh, I don't know. Maybe we'll just eat half of this today, and, and then maybe if it doesn't come tomorrow, maybe it'll rain and we won't get it. I don't know. But then it turned into maggots. They didn't trust. They didn't trust that the Lord was, was being honest with them, even though that's exactly how the Lord had treated them all the way up to this point. That's exactly how the Lord wanted to relate to them. And that is exactly how the Lord wants to relate to you and me. He wants you to know him. Did it ever occur to you that, that maybe part of the reason why we tend to grumble and complain a lot in our life is maybe our relationship with God isn't as strong and intimate as we maybe think it is? I, I'm not talking a, a, about the, um, you know, that bitterness of soul that comes when we're dealing with a a very real personal tragedy, like the, the death of a loved one or a real serious medical problem. That's not what I'm talking I'm talking about, you know, go to the closet, get out the violin and play yourself the saddest song you know how because life is just so terrible and bad for you and, and it couldn't get any worse and nothing's going your way and nobody likes me and I'm just going to eat dirt. That kind of stuff. You ever, did it ever occur to you that maybe the reason we feel that way sometimes is is because we don't really know the Lord. That, that maybe we know about the Lord in our head, that, that we know, yep, he's God, he's all, all powerful, I know that. But we know that, but we don't feel it. We don't care about it, the way he cares about us. Especially for people who come and know, right? Who should know, right? Like us, who hear God's word, who ought to know how God feels about us. So what does God do? God makes himself known. Right? That, that's why these, these, these histories in the Old Testament are there for us, so that we can know how, how God feels. That, did you catch that in Paul's letter, talking about why, why do we have these stories from the Old Testament? Well, so we can learn from the Israelites, so we can see a reflection in their life of our own life, right? As we, as we see how Israel struggled in their relationship with the Lord, we gain insight into our own relationship with the Lord. And I think primarily, especially in this section, we, we see a great example of how patient the Lord is. I mean, remember, the Lord has done a lot for the Israelites. We were just talking about the plagues and the crossing of the Red Sea. There's other things in, included in all of that. And still they don't trust in him, right? Kind of like the, the Jews with Jesus. You mean raising the dead and, and making bread out of thin air wasn't enough for them? Come on, what more do you want? I think that shows us that... Um, you know, some people will say to me, well, you know, yeah, I'd believe in God if he, if he came down and did some great miracle in my life or, or, or revealed himself to me. Then I'd believe in him. Uh-uh, nope. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. We see that here, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Doesn't work that way. Miracles don't create faith. God creates faith. God's love. God, God gives us these stories in the Old Testament to see how patient he is with grumbling Israelites, with, with slow and selfish people like us, so that we can see his love. And it is his love, which God knows, will eventually win those stubborn human hearts over and create faith. It is his love which will turn those hearts of stone into hearts of flesh, so that they will hear and grow and understand God's message. That's how God wants us to know him. 
And you know what he does? Be before we can even know him, he wants to know you. And so what does he do? He takes upon himself human flesh. And he lives your life as a man in the person of Jesus Christ. Here we have the manna from heaven, the bread of eternal life himself coming and living the kind of life that, that God wants all of us to live, to live in your place so that God could see with his own eyes and experience with his own life, with his own soul, with his own conscience, the sinful effects and the human tragedy and cost of sin so that he could see it all and then go to a cross and pay your price for it and shed his blood and take upon himself the sting of death. And... Having died, he could rise again so that he could claim for you and for me that eternal victory that, that we know we have life in his name. And so God has come and he makes himself known to you by knowing you. And then he reveals himself, right? He reveals himself in his word, right? We hear his word, these stories, these, these Bible passages, grade school kids, right? We're getting ready for another year of memorizing God's word. How important to place God's word into our hearts that we know the Lord, that we, that we know his voice, that we can pour through the pages of scripture and there in black and white is the very heart of God, his very thoughts that he wants you to know. And by his spirit, we do know those thoughts. So we have insight into God's love. We have insight into how much he cares about us. We have insight into to how he really feels about us. And then on top of all of that, he gives us the sacraments of, of baptism and holy communion. And in baptism, our sins washed away and we are made children of God. In holy communion, we, we see again how, how that bread of life wants to, to come to us and be a part of us. That we would be reassured our sins have been forgiven as we feast on his very body and blood and the bread and the wine. And in that most intimate way, literally a part of us, to know that he loves us. And then you will know the Lord. Then you will know the Lord. Because then... You know God's love. And, and knowing God's love means then that his commands are, they're not a burden. They're not a problem. You know, sometimes I think we get that flipped around, right? All right, I guess I better do that because that's what God tells me I better do. And maybe at some point I'll learn to like doing that. No, no, no. God changes your heart. And, and by changing your heart, he knows that then those, those commands he gives, just like the Israelites following the commands of the bread here, those commands that he gives will be a pure joy and a delight to us because we'll want to follow them. We'll want to be kind and loving and compassionate to our neighbors and other people in this world. We will want to honor and respect our spouse. We'll want to treat other people's reputation very carefully. We will want to honor God in our lives as the most important person and the most important relationship. So get to know the Lord. Stay connected to his word. Stay connected to worship. Stay connected to your prayer life. Stay connected to your Savior. Jesus once looked at his disciples and he said to them, don't you know me yet? That's that heart of God. Speaking to each one of us. The heart of God that just wants to be known. Known by you through his word. Known by you through his love. And by his grace we do know him. By his grace we can hear his voice. By his grace we can follow him. And by his grace you will know the Lord. Amen.